Are you taking AP Human Geography? If so, you're in the right place. I'm John from Marco. I'm joined by Danny Sanchez, who is at the Human Geo Guy. Danny, welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about geographic foundations. What, first of all, what are geographic foundations? That's a fancy way of saying basically unit one in the course. Okay. It's like the starting point for everything that you're learning and how it all connects together down the road as you pr proceed through all the content. So the main things I'll be focusing today is gonna be the use of uh, regions and diffusion, how they can be applied to the exam specifically as well. Wow, that sounds very smart of you. Um, and I can't wait for all our AP Human Geography people. Welcome, if you like this video, press the like button, subscribe to our channel. We're gonna be going live several more times this month. We'll be posting that on our Instagram page, which is just at Marco Learning. But I wanna show you a really awesome Instagram page for anyone taking AP uh, Human Geography. And that of course is Danny's page, which is at the Human Geo Guy, which I'm gonna pull up real quick here. Um, and uh, Danny's also, this, this is where, this is the path to a five, I think, is looking at this picture of the masked cheesehead from Florida. There's probably some demographic lesson on this, but on this channel, which is at the Human Geo Guy, Danny is holding a globe, he's going live, he's helping all the human geo people. And also this is breaking news here on the Marco Learning YouTube channel. Danny Sanchez at the Human Geo Guy is on TikTok, ladies and gents. That he happened is. today, that happened today. It happened today, go there now. There's I'm practicing my moves. It, it's <laughs> like that, right? You gotta, this is called dancing now, right? <laughs> That's it, right. And all Gen Z will come for you in the comments and they will tell you that you're a millennial or something, or you're a boomer or some, they'll find some insult, they'll hurl it at you. Um, but again, at the Human Geo Guy on Instagram, at the Human Geo Guy on TikTok, follow him. And in this video, Danny, you're going to guide us through um, all of the things that we need to know. Really, the we call this series the AP Exam Hack Series, fast ways that you guys can improve your score. So as you're coming in, say hello in the chat. We've got a lot of people here. Welcome and post your questions. I'm going to be answering some of those questions and I'll be posting links in the description in the chat. So Danny, you can go ahead and share your screen. All um, right. Walk us through how to figure out the wonderful world of human geography. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to be uh, a quick little agenda here. We already got welcomed, exam format, exam hacks, a couple things there. Big idea. One is going to be regions, like I said earlier, and also a brain break. I think we might even meet the CEO of Marco Learning today. I think we might be meeting Marco a little bit later. All right. And the second big idea, which is diffusion, as I go through this, it's not going to be just content. I wanted to also relate it to how these type of questions can be, how they can be portrayed on the AP exam. All right, so let's work our way through. The first thing we'll talk about is the format. And this has been a big topic of discussion of late, ever since College Board announced that we might be doing, not might be, that there are exam options. And I know every district is handling it differently. Some districts are making uniform decisions across the board. My school district where I teach in Florida, they're actually doing it where you're able to choose on your own which one you want to do. So your options are going to be paper and pencil at school May 4th. I didn't put the time because it depends on your time zone. Everybody's taking at the same exact time all around the world. You know, so if you're like in China, you might be taking it at 2 a.m. But the paper and pencil exam at school May 4th is 12 p.m. Eastern time, which every other time zone has to adjust off of that. All right. Then the digital at home test that's May 28th or June 8th. There are two separate dates for that. Um, as far as what I suggest to you, what the preference might be, I know some of you might not have a choice, but for those who do have a choice, I am strongly team paper and pencil. And there are many reasons why I'm strongly team paper and pencil, which I'll get into in a moment when I talk about the actual structure of the exam, what the exam is going to look like. All right. So, uh, the format of the exam, you're going to have 60 multiple choice questions in 60 minutes. Why do I think if you have the option, you should do the paper exam? I'm a strong proponent of the paper exam for a variety of reasons, right? The first one I'll get into is simply this, you can go backwards. And I know that might be a big deal for some of you who like to check your answers, who like to go back and just double check you didn't make any like simple little mistakes that made you uh, made you bubble the wrong thing or something like that, or a, a question you want to go back to because you're not sure on, but you're spending too much time on it. 
uh, on the paper exam, you can go backwards like a traditional standard, you know, multiple choice bubbling exam. On the digital one, that's not an option. Like once you lock in an answer, you are stuck on it, all right? Also, the writing portion of it, three FRQs, you have 75 minutes for this. If you're doing the paper and pencil exam, you can divide the time how you want it. If you are doing the digital exam, you are locked into 25 minutes per FRQ. And the reason that, that I very strongly suggest you don't do it that way, I'm going to reveal in the exam hacks. So again, multiple choice, 60 questions, 60 minutes, FRQs, three FRQs, 75 minutes. The, the exam format's the same, whether it's paper and pencil or digital. If you have the choice, I'm strongly advocating to do the paper exam on May 4th. All right. So first hack, all right. Vocab, vocab, and more vocab. Any of my students will tell you that Mr. Sanchez is insane when it comes to vocab. I give like super high stakes, high pressure vocab quizzes. And the reason I do that is because vocabulary is the foundation of this course, probably more so than any other AP exam. All right. So you have about 500 key terms in there and any one of them could be a, a question. Also, one of the reasons why I'm, an, I'm advocating for the paper exam is vocab on the paper exam, they might actually just have you identify a definition for a few of the multiple choice questions. In contrast, if you're at the digital at home, you know, if you can be creative and find ways to look up answers, they're going to avoid something that's easily Googleable. I, I, I don't know if that's a real word, but it is now. I just made it. Boom. Dropping words on you. New vocab. All right. But the main thing I want to emphasize to you is I truly believe that digital exam is going to be harder. And it's not going to be the type of questions that you can just, all right, hey, Siri, what is a transnational corporation? That's not the type of thing you're going to be able to just look up and find an instant answer to. So again, if you have vocab under your belt, you are able to really make that work for you, particularly on the paper exam where you might have just some straight up vocab questions. All right. The second one, and this is something that drives me crazy, and I'll be sharing this with you in a few minutes. Sometimes the same thing has three different names and it is mind blowing to me. I'll have kids while well, Mr. Sanchez, you never taught us this concept. And I, and they're like, what concept is it? They tell me they're like, Oh, that's just another name for this. And they're like, cause they're like, that's not fair. I knew the other name for it, for this. I didn't know this name. Well, some things have two, three, four different names. We're going to get into a, some, into a few of those when we talk about the different type of regions that we have. So the multiple choice hacks are just going to be to study the heck out of vocab, because not only do you need to know definitions, but you might have to apply that definition and you can identify an example if you know that definition. So vocab, vocab, vocab is the foundation of everything we do and know that certain things have two, sometimes three different names. All right. And like I said, give me some of those examples in a little bit. All right. Continue from there. FRQ hacks. Here are a couple of things to help you on the AP exam specifically for your writing. First off with the paper exam, you don't have to write them in order. And I'm going to say to you, if you have 75 minutes and three FRQs to write, well, mathematically 75 divided by three is 25 minutes each, right? Yeah, but not so fast because I want you to think about it this way. Let's say you look at the three FRQs and you have a really hard one, one you feel okay about, and one that you feel like is a piece of cake slam dunk. That's where you're going to just rack a bunch of points. Well, does it make any sense to bang your head against the wall on the hard one to only squeeze one or two points out of it if you really feel overwhelmed by it? No, that doesn't make sense. So I have my students adjust their time. If you're, if you have the 75 minutes, give that extra five or 10 minutes to the one you know best. Make sure you squeeze out every last point. If when, there's seven possible points, if you get five or six out of that, that's, that's a game changer. That's the difference between a four and a five. If you get to one of those high scores there in contrast on the hard one, if you find that one hard, 
there's a chance most people find that one hard and the average score for that one is going to be significantly lower, therefore probably dropping the cut score. So one thing to keep in mind is play with your time. Focus on the things you know, and don't freak out about the things you don't know. The things you don't, not the effort you're not as strong on, hey, get a couple of points out of it and move on. Also, the one that you know very well, commit more time to that. Hey, that's a life lesson. Focus on what you know, not what you don't know. All right, continuing, use the stimulus. If they give you a map, it's there for a reason. If they give you a chart, it's there for a reason. If they give you a picture, it's there for a reason. It's not there to look pretty. The only thing there to look pretty is this face. Sorry, couldn't resist, had to do it. All right, but definitely make sure that you are referencing back to that picture. Today, I was going over it for some of my students, and there's a picture of one thing, and they're answering about something else. I'm like, they gave you the picture. Use it. Talk about the picture. Talk about the shiny colors. All right. So make sure for the FRQs that you're using the stimulus. All right. And the third FRQ hack, ask yourself what additional information would help you. There is usually one of the FRQs that has something along the lines of what information is missing? What additional information? And just ask yourself, what would make this easier to write? If you knew like average incomes or the natural increase rate of a country, would this make it easier to answer? Because they might be looking for that as a, you know, describe information that would help you explain this better. So I'm not saying it exactly, but something to that effect. What information is missing? All right, so those are our exam hacks, all right? Um, I want to now shift to the big ideas. So we'll do a little bit of content and relate it to how it can be applied on an exam. All right. Region. So the first thing I want to talk about region, an area that shares a common feature. So this is going to be an area, keyword area. So it's not just one place, it's many places tied together. All right. And the first type of region we're going to look at is a formal region. Right. And this is an area in which all or a vast majority of the people share a common characteristic, becoming an identifying characteristic. It's one of the ways you figure out what this place actually is. And remember, I told you earlier that I was going to tie it back to the exam. There are multiple names for a formal region. It's not just the formal region. It can also be called a uniform region. And a little brain trick I do with my students as far as uniform regions go is to understand if you go to a school where everybody wears a uniform, the point of that uniform is that everybody looks the same. It's such a common characteristic that everybody has the same thing going on. Some of the examples I put here, political borders, physical characteristics, language, religion, voting patterns, et cetera. I'm gonna pull up a couple of them for you here. All right, here is a quick visual. Here's a map of the world and it shows you all of the countries. And what you need to realize is that each country is its own formal or uniform region. When you're within the United States, you have to follow and obey the laws of the United States. The same thing when you're in India, when you're in China, when you're in Russia, when you're within the borders, all right, you must follow their laws. You are beholden to their government. So, some, so that is why it's a uniform region. They have this, the land area mapped out. Everybody within it is following the same. All right. Um, continuing from there, also voting patterns. All right. And I use 2012 because I'm just going to say this 2016 and 2020 were kind of odd election years. And a lot of patterns that normally hold true didn't hold true in that election cycle. But there's a, a few broad patterns that you can pick up, pick up here. And the broad patterns that you can pick up are gonna be that certain parts of the country vote Democrat. Hey, all right, wait, let me change my color on that. Hey, the Northeast tends to vote Democrat. The Great Lakes tends to vote Democrat. The West Coast tends to vote Democrat. These are patterns you can pick up on. In contrast, for, this, for the Republican party, the South tends to vote Republican and the Great Plains states 
tend to vote Republican. These parties count on these states consistently voting the same way. And tying this to the political unit later on, one of the things that comes up here, there are certain states in previous election cycles that have flipped from their normal pattern in order to change the presidential outcome. In 2016, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin voted Republican for the first time since I was like four years old, all right? And that in 2016 flipped it to President Trump. In contrast, in 2020, North Carolina, not sorry, not North Carolina, my apologies, not North Carolina, all right? It was Georgia, Georgia and Arizona and then Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin all flipped back to Democrats. So the point is we've got broad patterns, all right? And also tying into more political stuff, a lot of that relates also to voting patterns within the state. Cities tend to vote Democrat. Rural areas tend to vote Republican. You also get ethnic breakdowns and all that. But the main thing to establish for you here is that the patterns changed and therefore 2016 went one way and 2020 flipped back the other. So these are formal regions. The South votes Republican. And somebody, may, but Mr. Sanchez, I have a uncle who lives in Texas and he votes Democrat. Yes, but that makes him the exception. The broader pattern is the people that vote Republican throughout Texas, all right? So that takes care of formal regions, which can also be called uniform region. Remember those interchangeable names. All right. We go to the next type of region, which is a functional region. All right. It's going to be an area organized an, around the node or focal point. Hence the terms also node. No, oh, wrong color. Let me go yellow nodal or focal region. Three names for the same thing. Functional region, nodal region, focal region. All right. And I have a couple examples here that I want to show you. And by the way, in the perfect world, the functional region would be a circle, a, a circle with a dot in the middle. Now, let's shift to the next slide. NFL fan zones. This is Facebook data compiled to show where fans of certain teams live. And what you'll notice throughout here is that certain patterns are in play. The Seahawks play in Seattle, the Pacific Northwest roots for them. The 49ers are in San Francisco, Northern California roots for them. The Broncos are in Denver and this whole area of roots for the Broncos, all right? That's the functional region. They're not always perfect circles, but there's a node and the area that extends out from around it, all right? The next example I'm gonna show you of a functional region and John, I bet John knew it was coming, there's always a reference to the world's greatest supermarket, Publix, in my presentations, all right? This is a map of the area in which I teach in. This is Stewart, Florida, a little place you probably ever heard of unless you're from around here. And I know some of my students and from the neighboring schools are here as well. These are Publix supermarkets. And each supermarket is its own functional region. Why? The people who live in certain areas are going to shop at certain publixes. They might not be perfectly centered, but the point is they all serve a, a here's the easy way to think about, think about it. They serve a function, functional region. They are the center point from around at which people go and buy their groceries. And on a side note, I just wanna say something. People think the biggest attraction in Florida is Disney World or the beach. You have not lived until you've had a Publix chicken tender sub. Amen. Moving on from functional regions, we go to vernacular regions, all right? And vernacular regions are areas that people perceive to be similar as part of their or somebody else's cultural identity, all right? Basically, it's how you see yourself or how others see you. So I actually prefer the term perceptual region because, because perception is all about how you see the world, all right? So a perceptual region is, is going to apply to how you or others see you, which also connects the idea of a mental map. When I think of a certain part of the country, what am I thinking about? And the example I want to give you here is 
the South. I didn't grow up in the South. I live in the South now, living in Florida, but I grew up in New Jersey. And the way that I was taught to like perceive the South was, well, those are all the states that broke away during the Civil War or during the Civil Rights Movement. Those are all the racist states. Man, there's much more depth to what's going on in the South than just the bad things, but we also have to acknowledge the bad things that happen there, all right? So here's a map of the United States, and what it shows you is the South, and the darker colors are going to show you the deep South. And this also is going to apply to exam strategy, all right? This is what's called a choropleth map. And the darker the shade of the color, the more that is represented. That's the type of thing that you're going to have to be able to identify on the AP exam. And you might have an FRQ. And one of the questions might be, you know, name a state, identify, sorry, identify a state that is considered to be part of the deep south. And what you have to do is recognize that this darker red color is that deep, deep south. And all you got to do at that point is name South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, or Louisiana. That's the deep, deep south. And that will be a simple way to get an easy point. Because here's the other thing I want to tell you about the FRQs. People freak out about FRQs. I'm not a good rider. I panic. I freeze. Relax. There's always one or sometimes two easy points to find on every single FRQ. And that magic word you might be looking for is identify. Literally, can you just point something out? Can you find an example of this once you know what you're looking for? All right. So that is it for that. I'm going to ask John to come back in. I think we got a little brain break, maybe even meet the CEO of Marco Learning. That will, I'll get him in a minute. Um, first of all, I want to thank, there's a great crowd in the chat tonight. I want to thank. Um, we were picking on you for the public's ad that you were paid for. I was just acknowledging for legal obligations, the payment that has been wired monthly by Publix into your account for the shameless uh, commercial plugs. We have a lot of people here, by the way. Um, and yeah, a lot of people who are uh, even former AP Human Geography students if you are enjoying this video, definitely press that like button. Let us know how we can help you out. As a reminder, if you don't currently follow Danny Sanchez on his Instagram page at the Human Geo Guy, definitely do that. You can also follow him on his TikTok page, which is at the Human Geo Guy. Um, and there's some great resources. You know, one question we get a lot, uh, Danny, is about um, sort of little break here about the best resources to study for AP Human Geography. Uh, should I use a prep book? Should I use Quizlet? Should I watch videos? Like, how do I navigate the resources for AP Human Geo? Well, the resources up to my preference are, first off, as far as a review book, to me, without question, the top review book is the AMSCO Human Geography book. The author's David Palmer, phenomenal teacher out of Colorado, did a great job putting that together. That's the one I have my own students buy. It is to me, hands down, the easiest read and the most comprehensive. So, uh, and uh, available on Amazon. <laughs> uh, still, you can get prime delivery on it. Hasn't sold out yet. Um, as far as uh, actual practice for the exam, a great app is the iScore 5 app, where basically it's like that game Trivia Crack, but for Human Geo, you can play against people, you can compete, you can uh, actually see, you know, the type, the style of questions that you would see on the AP exam. They even have like stimulus that you can break down. So that's a really great resource as well. And that is a, that's a $5 investment. That, that'll be the best five bucks you ever spend getting ready for this exam. I normally tell my students to download it as the exam gets closer. For my own students that are here, I'll tell them, uh, to hold off a little bit, because then we will be working a lot of that as the exam gets closer. But the iScore 5 app is a phenomenal app. On YouTube, there's a great teacher by the name of Mr. Sin. He has some great review videos. He also has a review packet that he puts together. That's a really good product that you can uh, get your hands on. And I feel like I'm forgetting one that I normally use. But those are those are my big three for right now. Those are my big three for right now. And while you were mentioning those, Danny, I en entered those into the chat. So everyone, that's the AMSCO book. The link is in the chat. I score five app. The link is in the chat. And Mr. Sin's YouTube channel. Link is in the chat. 
Danny, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I, uh, I'm going to give you this screen sharing. Um, and let's get right into it because Ava is asking or mentioned in the chat that this is helping her so much right now. So I don't want to interrupt. Okay. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad it's helping Ava. It is. And we've got a lot of people like this video. If you are enjoying this video, press that like button, subscribe. We're going to be going live for AP Human Geography several more times this month. We're posting the schedule on the Marker Learning Instagram page. So definitely follow before, us before, there. I, I'm on again Friday. Friday night, a little earlier, 8 o'clock. A little earlier, Friday night, 8 o'clock. So that's what Friday uh, is that Friday the thirteenth? Friday the, I don't know. It's like the one year anniversary of like the world turning upside down. Yes. So yes. I think. Hang on. I'm going to check. That's the twelve. It's a twelve. It's a twelve. Okay, yeah. Friday the twelfth, the anniversary of the world uh, upside down. So I'll let you share your screen again. And um, yeah, looks like people. Um, in fact, there's a there's one person in the chat who used the I Score Five app as well. So you got two of here. Excellent for the i right. five app. Um, and yeah, I'll, so I'm gonna hang out in the chat. If you guys have questions, post them there. And I wanna thank you guys for watching. All right, back to our second big idea. All right, and let me share this with you. All right, we're gonna be talking about diffusion. All right, um, first off, diffusion, the process by which a feature spreads. So one thing I, I just wanna drop on you here, an idea, an innovation, a feature. The assumption is once it happens, it's going to spread. The only question, does it spread a lot or does it spread a little bit? Does it spread quickly? Does it spread slowly? Those are all things we're going to break down as we get into each type of diffusion. There's four main types of diffusion, all right? Um, a hearth is a place where an innovation begins, all right? So where does this originate from? What is the origin point? And I'm going to tie this, since this is a review, un it's unit one, but since this is a review, I'm going to tie in something from the religious unit. Uh, the type of question you could be asked on the AP exam would be something like, which of these religions is no longer practiced in its hearth? And the reality is the most likely answer to that question is Buddhism. Because Buddhism started in northern India and Nepal, but in both of those places has been uh, basically either completely replaced or like in Nepal is just a small minority religion and has been replaced by Hinduism, right? So that is showing you how this concept could be specifically applied to a multiple choice style question, all right? Additionally, I want to look at the slowest type of diffusion, which is relocation diffusion, all right? And that's a spread of a feature through physical movement. And the key emphasis here is that it happens very slowly. Oh, sorry, it happens very slowly. And I kind of already gave away what I'm gonna to go to now. But what's most often used as an example for relocation diffusion is the Amish. And the reason why the Amish is because they don't deal with modern technology. They have rejected modern technology and they basically, they kick it old school. You know, they churn their butter, they ride a horse and buggy, you know, they bake all their goods. By the way, just for future reference, if you ever visit an Amish community, their baked goods are the best because everything's all natural, all organic. And as I like to joke, they cook with fire the way God intended. So it is amazing. It is amazing. If you ever visit an Amish community, get their desserts. They are out of this world, right? But the point is this. If your culture is spreading by horse and buggy, I hate to break it to you, but your culture is not going to spread very fast. And because it's not going to spread very fast, it's not going to have a massive growth of the population. So that's what you have to remember. Relocation literally means physical movement. And that physical movement there, an Amish horse and buggy, is not something that's going to get you from point A to point B very quickly. Therefore, your culture is not going to spread as quickly. Also, tying it to unit three, cultural connections. The Amish are a great example of relocation diffusion. They're also a great example of folk culture, that tr those traditional values. And they, if you remember the old Prince song, party like it's 1999, they party like it's 17. 
99. That's how they kick it. All right, continuing. Next, we're going to be looking at the different types of expansion diffusion. And there are three types of expansion diffusion. That's what I'm going to go over in the next few uh, pictures and uh, in the next few slides. And for this one, again, for these, I don't even bother putting pictures because we are like living and breathing examples of this. All right. So the first one I want to go over is called hierarchical diffusion. And I want to emphasize for you that idea of it being higher. All right. It's hierarchical diffusion, something from up high. And the definition is spread of a feature from a position of power or authority. All right. Power or authority. All right. Examples, celebrity endorsements, urban centers, things coming from the rich uh, and things coming from the rich world to the poor world. So I'm going to start off by saying at this moment, I already was a shameless commercial for Publix. Now I'm a shameless commercial for Nike and Michael Jordan. All right. Celebrity endorsements is one of the things I really emphasized here. Ladies and gentlemen, literally on my chest right here is the famous logo that all of you are so familiar with. Michael Jordan, who last played a basketball game about four years before any of you were born. And yet a lot of you buy his shoes. A lot of you know that logo anywhere, the Jumpman logo it's called. You know, I grew up with that logo and fast forward, I'm, I'm a middle-aged man. You know, I need a cane to get from place to place. And the reality is all of you are still rocking the Jordans or going online to try to order them before they sell out on the sneakers app. So celebrity endorsement to me, the greatest possible example of this is the Jordan brand that I'm wearing right now. So that's why I didn't bother putting a picture here. I am a living and breathing example of higher arcal diffusion. The key thing to remember here, it comes from on high. Next, all right, contagious diffusion. The rapid and broad spread of a feature through a population. Geez, can we think of anything that's contagious these days? And also with the key feature being how fast it happens, again, I didn't need a picture for this because we are living and breathing this right now. I'm shouting through my mask to try to teach my lessons all day long at school. And the example here, illness going through a population with the example being COVID-19. All right, obviously. All right. So the final type of diffusion, and at the end, I'm going to stop and just talk you through how these could be applied specifically to an FRQ. Actually, a couple of years ago, it was applied exactly to an FRQ, all right? Stimulus diffusion. Stimulus diffusion is a spread of an idea even if the specific feature fails to spread, all right? So the concept works but the actual way by which it's spread doesn't, all right? Think of social media. My first social media account was MySpace. There was even something before that called Friendster, but it wasn't as popular. I still remember when my friend said, hey, Danny, sign up for this thing. I'm like, what is this thing? It's, it's MySpace. So what did she goes, you post pictures here and funny things. You're gonna be good at this. I'm like, all right. Cool. Next thing I know, I went down the rabbit hole of social media and I've been sucked in ever since. All right. But MySpace eventually died and gets replaced by Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. Don't forget to follow at the Human Geo Guy and at Marco Learning for all of our accounts. All right. So social media survived, but MySpace didn't. That is when the idea spreads, but not the feature. And hey, how are we all connecting here today? YouTube, another social media account. That's why I didn't bother with any pictures for these three, because at every step along the way, from the Jordan logo to the mask, to us being on YouTube right now, we are living and breathing every example 
of expansion diffusion. All right, now I want to give you how you can apply this to an exam. A few years ago, what you had was an FRQ that had slang terms. And these slang terms were like cool, hip, I, I forget what they were, but uh, funky noob was on there. And it talked about how like slang terms throughout the years. And one of the things that came up, and I'm going to go backwards for a second, is, you know, give an example of how relocation diffusion can spread a slang term. Give an example of how higher article diffusion can be a slang term. Give an example how some, can some, something be contagious diffusion of a slang term. And at this point, a lot of kids made a mistake. And the mistake they made was, well, I see a vocab term, so I'm just going to define it. They're not asking you for a definition. They're asking you to apply it in the real world, all right? And for relocation diffusion, a simple way of explaining that as it related to slang was, hey, a person knows a slang term, they move to another place, and it spreads throughout the new population relocation diffusion applied specifically to a slang term. All right, higher article diffusion. A famous person says a term and all of a sudden it becomes mainstream and popular throughout the population. Remember the year that, um, the, the year that this was a, uh, that this was an FRQ, true story. You had kids using Cardi B and her going, oh, and all that silly stuff. And it really applied and it was a good example and it got points, all right? And the other example, if I remember correctly, was contagious diffusion, where basically just, hey, one person knows a term, they say it to other people, other people start saying it and it begins to grow rapidly as a slang term. So this here is not just an example of diffusion in terms of vocab terms. This is an example here in terms of how you can actually apply the vocab term. Can you recognize how this would look in the real world and applied it specifically to an FRQ? All right, so that takes care of the second big idea. Um, if I could get John back in and hopefully the CEO makes an appearance. John, you there? Here he comes. Here's the one. Oh, there he is. There he is. There he is, the CEO. He was, he was digging in the yard. Hey, stop it with your little. <laughs> here we go. Oh. And we'll, here, stop screen sharing for just a minute. Oh, sorry we'll about that. Full, no, no, that's fine. Okay. We'll get the full. Oh, wow. You can see how dirty he is for digging in the yard. <laughs> Marco. And he, there's, he's got his whole jar of little treats here. This is like a little bit of AP exam ASMR. He's a little wound <laughs> up though. He's not calm. Say hi to everyone. See, now I gotta wash his, his face and take him away from this church. Oh, he said too many treats. In these other videos, I get like super exhausted because actually he is like 80% overweight. So he's just crushing. How much does he weigh? What was that? Oh, I don't know. 390 pounds. I, he, <laughs> it's like he's supposed to weigh 65 pounds, but I think he weighs like 78. So, okay. But the more of these videos we do every day on our YouTube channel, the more treats I feed him and the carrots are healthy. And this little thing of his little treats is not, oh, now he's back. Um, but anyway, no, this is super helpful, Danny. And I think you've identified some really specific ways that these rules, these ideas, these hacks apply to the actual free response question. So one question I, I have, and this has come up a lot in our videos, is people want to know, you know, you said at the beginning, your team paper and pencil, if you get a choice, go paper and pencil. Not everyone's getting a choice. If you're on the digital format and you're stuck going question by question, you can't go back on individual questions. You got to download this software. You have to type your responses. It's a very weird format. Um, do you have any tips for, oh, actually, yeah, I'm going to ask you about this and then I'm going to ask a, about a question we just got. And if you, by the way, if you have questions, post them in that chat. We're going to, we're going to ask Danny them now. 
Um, and if you like this video, press that like button. Um, and so, but so you're on the digital exam. I mean, have you seen the some of the early pictures of this? We won't know a lot till April 8th. I've seen the pictures of what it's going to look like that you shared out. And I will tell you, if you feel like you're struggling with a question, and I, I want you to think about it. If you feel like you've been there more than a minute, at that point, just try to do an educated guess and move on. Because the last thing you want to do is spend seven minutes on one question that you're probably going to get wrong anyway. You know, right. just cut your losses and move on. And if you've got to do that five times on the test, well, the law of statistical averages says you're going to get one right just out of sheer, you know, dumb luck guessing. And maybe even better if you could eliminate an option. Like I would try to make sure if, if you see, I don't know if they'll have a time function. If it, they, uh, will. Uh, they will have a timer. If you realize more than a minute's ticked off, you're done. It has this, the universe has decided for you. You're not getting that question right. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that that's something people underestimate, right? This is not just about knowing content. It's not just about doing certain things. It's also about doing it under time constraints. And remember for most AP exams, you don't need to, you do not need to um, get 85% or 95% of the questions correct. What do I need for a five on AP Human Geo? Uh, I've seen this. I've seen the sliding scales. I think it's out of like 120 points. If you get to like 70, you're in the ballpark. Yeah. So you get to, and that's most AP exams. You get to around. So let me just, that's actually just want to frame this a little differently for everyone. If you get 70 ish percent, so like a C minus on the multiple choice and you get around 70% of the free response questions, that C minus thumbs up is a perfect five. So unlike, and I teach a lot of standardized tests. I taught SAT, ACT, LSAT, all these different tests. This is the only testing system in the world that gives perfect scores for C minus level work. If you want a three, you want a passing score, you need a nice sturdy F at 53%, right? So <laughs> it differs from year to year, but that's a real reassurance for all of you doing this. Now, two other quick questions we got in. We got our friend Tom Ritchie in the chat, who is a legend for AP. The GOAT, the AP. GOAT is here. The GOAT of AP Euro, AP US, AP US Gov on his channel. Check him out. But two of the questions we got here were about the Princeton Review book for AP Human Geo. I know you're, we, you said you're big on the AMSCO book, um, which is a great one. And um, the Barron's flashcards resource. Have you, what have your students done with Quizlets and Barron's flashcards? Before? Well, those Barron's cards, if I remember, they have not reprinted them in a minute. So they're out of date. So if you're going to use them, you almost have to go through the CED, the course exam and description, and just funnel out the ones you don't need. Because I can tell you there's a bunch of things there that you're not going to need. So that, that would be my main suggestion with the Barron's cards. And one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pop in the chat real quick. Danny mentioned the AP Human Geo CED. This course and exam description is kind of like the Bible of AP Human Geo. Um, and this is what officially the course writers, the exam writers and teachers are supposed to use. I have them right over here because I have no friends. So here's my <laughs> AP World CED. I went to an AP World History teacher training and got one of these and I was there. That's where excited. all the cool kids keep it. That's where all the cool kids keep it. I know, right here. This is at this <laughs> desk I've been sitting at for a year. Um, so that, of course, in the exam description is the rule book. What can appear on the exam and what is only optional for them to appear in the exam? So you said earlier, I, I took down notes. If I if I mention Cardi B, I'll get a five. That's what I wrote down. And so that Cardi B is not in the CED, but all the all these other categories. You know, when we talk about the the definitions of diffusion or some of these principles, we need to know those. So check out the course and exam description there. It's a really great resource. Danny, do you have any other parting tips, hacks, advice? for the people here. And let me know everyone if you have, um, actually there's one other question before I, I turn it over to you. How long should I spend on each unit studying? So it's early March. Some of you are gonna be watching this recording the night before I left us. But like, if you've got two full months, how do you spend your time? And if any of my own students are here, they, they can vouch for the fact that I say this. I, I do warn them. The, the six weeks before the exam are kind of miserable because we're wrapping up new material, starting to review old material, kind of overlaps with each other. So I tell them for six weeks, it's miserable. 
but then there's light at the end of the tunnel. And then, you know, it's like class becomes Netflix. You know, first thing we watch is Wally. Wally's the answer to life. All right. But um, basically, I calculate those seven units into six weeks, but I don't have a set formula like, oh, well, unit one is a week and each one's a week and you move on. Some of them are a little longer. Like unit three, the cultural one, there's a lot of information you can drown in. You know, in most textbooks, it's four chapters and it's just one unit. In contrast, like farming and political and the political geography, each of them is only one chapter in a textbook. So what I'm going to tell you is in the last six weeks leading up to the exam, I kind of condense it all as needed, but there's not just like a week each. You kind of got to play with it. Unit one, you can do in probably about four or five days of review, but yeah. unit three, you might need a full week. So it, it, you have to kind of fluctuate with it. Yeah, and see how that's the whole point about how far behind everyone is and kind of those, those last few weeks are like, it's different for everyone. Now we're getting a couple questions here about prep books and guys, I'll, I'll summarize the prep book situation by saying this, the, the AMSCO book is really become the gold standard, A-M-S-C-O. I put the link in the chat before, I'll put it in again. For almost all AP subjects, it's the most up-to-date, but also check out the links, um, the links in our description. And in fact, I think, um, I'm going to put this, I've got the link in the, the chat as well. One of the things we have at Marco Learning is our AP Human Geography student support course. So we have a few up-to-date tests, classes taught by this guy. And what's so cool about this is you'll send us your free response essays and we're actually going to score them and send you detailed feedback. And that's something your prep book can't do. So definitely check out that link in our, in our description. Um, those classes are going to start in early April, but I think if you're, if you're sticking with the AMSCO book, you're on really solid footing. If you're sticking with the iScore 5 app, that's a really great idea. Um, and if you are using um, the Mr. Sin's YouTube channel, you've got, you've got some really trusty resources. Danny, any parting thoughts for us? Any final exam hacks and tips you want to share with the students here? Well, well it's less an exam hack. It is more a life hack. Like, at some point, you're going to have to work hard at this. You're going to have to commit the time to do this. There is no cheat code to life. There is no cheat code to the AP exam. There are things that can make life easier, things that can make the exam easier. But ultimately, you're going to have to sit down, crack a book open, study, watch review videos, do practice questions. You're going to have to commit time to it. It's like I, I coach the cross-country team at my school. People ask me, how do you become a better runner? And my answer to that is run. <laughs> you have to run to be a better runner. Yeah. You have to do multiple choice questions to get better at them. You have to write FRQs to get better at them. Yeah. And there's so those everyone's talking about shortcuts. Everyone's on the Marco Learning TikTok account, spamming me and standing me with all these comments. And people are like, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to do all this stuff. No, you're not. You're going to just take your time and study and and work it out so listen danny thank you so much for joining us guys if you have if you do not follow him on his instagram page this is definitely i'm i know you're going to be going live we're going to get cheese head uh we're going to get mask jokes and some great um human geo tips here on at the human geo guy on instagram so thank you so much danny we're going to see you guys on friday evening friday march the 12th at 8 p.m is that right 8 p.m yes and um definitely be in touch everyone all right. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, everybody.